Uh, we have been talking about uh, various uh, properties of the quantum hall systems and uh, issues related to a quantum hall effect. Uh, we'll continue with that discussion and unfold uh, some more, um, you know, unanswered questions. Uh, so let me uh, start with uh, a nice idea that had been put forward by Laughlin, one of the persons who I said that got a Nobel Prize for um, the fractional quantum hall effect. So he had put this uh, idea called as a Corbino disk geometry. It's sometimes written with a DISK. So this is uh, due to Laughlin and uh, somehow it should not depend upon the geometry of the disk, uh, but this argument for this particular case it uh, it does. Uh, so what I you know uh, try to tell you here is that there is a disk, okay and it has an annular region. The electron gas actually resides here. So in this region between that and there is a hole inside, inside this region. So this is a, a disk geometry and this disk geometry has this 2D electron gas at low temperature, at low temperature because uh, we want the coherence of the electronic wave functions to exist so that the quantum phenomena becomes apparent uh, and that's why we want the, uh, the temperature to be low. And uh, this is the geometry and there is um, of course this uh, electrons are in presence of a magnetic field but in addition to that there is a magnetic field that threads so uh, this sample okay uh, or this system rather. And uh, this um, hole inside, so this is like a bagel shaped thing. So the hole inside is precisely that we are able to uh, thread it with a magnetic field. And um, as I said, the disk geometry is important in this particular case. Uh, and uh, so we thread a, a flux phi through this. And let's see that what this flux has got to do with Hall conductivity. Just a priori. Laughlin thought it to be this quantum Hall effect phenomena to be like a quantum pump which uh, pumps electrons from uh, one edge of this disk to the outer edge or the inner edge to the outer edge and so on. Okay, And um, so if we increase this flux slowly, okay, uh, I'll tell you what slowly means. If you increase this uh, flux slowly from 0 to some phi, Okay, and uh, say let's call it as a flux quantum which is phi 0. So just to remind you that uh, phi 0 is nothing but h over e and uh, once uh, when uh, uh, one does that, uh, so when I say slowly what I mean is that the uh, over a time period uh, that time period uh, let's call it as a t0 so slowly such that T0 is much much greater than the energy scale of the problem or the inverse of the energy scale of the problem and here the energy scale of the problem is given by omega b It's actually h cross omega b but uh, this is uh, we understand that this is uh, you know you can take h cross to be 1 for the moment or or you can write also h cross omega b. So uh, this is what I mean by slowly so you increase the flux slowly from 0 to this uh, flux quantum. And uh, if that happens, the classical electrodynamics says that whenever there is a change in flux, it's equivalent to an EMF being developed. So it will develop an EMF which is given by, uh, this is not electric field, so we'll write it as EMF. And uh, so this is actually like a voltage, it's called as electromotive force, but it's like a voltage. And this is equal to nothing but uh, this del phi del t. Okay, where del phi is the change in the flux or d phi dt if you wish. So uh, over a time t, so this is 0 to phi 0 uh, and in a time frame which is given by t0, so this is equal to, so the EMF developed is given by phi 0 by t0. Okay. So this is the EMF and uh, because of the EMF developed, there will be a transport of say n electrons from the inner edge of this disk which is here uh, 
uh, let me uh, show it by a color. So, the electrons from here will be transported to here. So, there will be n electrons that will be transported from the inner edge to the outer edge and uh, that will give rise to a current. Okay. And um, as I said that uh, there is a disc geometry, so the current is purely radial. Okay. So, the radial current that um, you know is uh, it uh, gets generated because of this transport of electrons n electrons is nothing but n e which is the total charge divided by the time over which this um, event takes place. So, it is minus n e by t 0 and um, so, the rho x y the basically the Hall uh, resistivity uh, you can call it a R h as well uh, this is equal to the E m f uh, which we have found out divided by the radial current which is I r which we have just written down. So, this is minus phi 0 divided by T 0 and divided by a minus N e over T 0. Okay. And this is nothing but this is equal to phi 0 the minus sign cancels the T 0 cancels and this is equal to N e and uh, this is uh, putting phi 0 equal to H over e uh, one gets H over N e square and this is precisely uh, the Hall resistivity that we have been talking about that. Uh, uh, these n uh, which denotes an integer and in this particular case n denotes a number of electrons that are transported from the, uh, the inner edge of this uh, system uh, to the outer edge of the system and uh, h over e square sets the scale of the resistivity and this is the Hall resistivity. So, uh, Laughlin actually viewed is as a quantum pump which pumps electrons from the inner edge of the sample to the outer edge. And this is a, a nice visualization of the quantum phenomena. So, that is what happens that there are one electron being transported from the inner edge to the outer edge or there are two electrons that are uh, transported from the inner edge to the outer edge as you increase the, the magnetic field that threads the system which is in the you know the region inside and uh, in the annular region where the two dimensional electron gas exists uh, that uh, responds to it by whose conductivity or the resistivity uh, behaves in this particular fashion. So, uh, this is one um, of the things that have been put forward at that time. Uh, let me tell you something interesting about the edge modes. You have heard uh, the edge modes um, taking part in conduction and conductivity of Landau levels. Okay. Once again I remind you of the picture let me draw it here so that so these are the closed orbits which do not give rise to any passage of current. However, the electrons do not get to complete full oscillation at the edges and they would uh, you know move in this uh, uh, fashion at the edges. So, they would give rise to drift as well as you know conductivity. It is very important to understand which we have not discussed and we are going to discuss now is that if the electrons actually move in this particular direction on the upper edge of the sample it will move in the opposite direction in the in the bottom edge of the sample uh, or in the other edge it could be reverse that is uh, at the upper edge it moves a, in a direction which is from uh, right to left or, or uh, and in the bottom it could be from left to right. Okay. Now, uh, these are called as chiral modes. And these chiral modes exist at the boundaries of the sample or at the edges of the sample and they are called chiral because there is certain kind of handedness or chirality 
um, which means that uh, they are uh, you know uh, opposite in direction um, at the two edges okay and um, so you can um, visualize it as uh, just like a highway uh, on either side of the highway the uh, the cars move in different directions uh, the kind of drive that we have we moved on the left side of the lane and uh, the ones that are going from uh, in, in a particular direction moves in the uh, in the forward direction say moves in the left lane and whereas the one that uh, comes in the other direction would move in the right lane and so these electrons exactly follow this lane structure uh, and uh, just like the cars uh, follow the lane driving for safe uh, you know driving the the electrons uh, they follow these uh, safe driving principle and they only propagate in one direction uh, at uh, one edge of the sample okay now uh, this hasn't been made uh, clear and we are going to make that clear now and uh, we also want to understand how these edge modes appear okay uh, let's again uh, write down the hamiltonian in the landau gauge which we have done earlier uh, more than once so uh, the the kinetic energy uh, is written as uh, so these are so okay i have written 2m outside and we have taken again a gauge in which um, so it's a gauge that is uh, there in the y direction so the gauge is that the uh, this is 0 bx 0 and so on so x is the uh, coordinate uh, x coordinate and b is the magnetic field and in this gauge um, it's a uh, sorry i should write it uh, the so it's uh, plus uh, e b x um, square uh, and a plus there's a square and plus now there is a v x that comes uh, so your a is equal to 0 b x 0 okay now this uh, v of x is coming for the edges uh, because of the presence of edges so uh, let's see how it can be um, you know understood so this v x is like a potential that is felt by the electrons uh, say for example you have uh, a potential which is say given by this and uh, there are these edges and the edges give rise to a potential uh, for uh, the electrons because they cannot go out of the sample so it is like a potential that they feel at the edges where they have infinite potential uh, such that they are unable to go out it's just like a particle in a box so at the edges they feel this potential um, let's say uh, between some minus a and plus a which uh, defines the dimension of the sample okay and uh, of course in the absence of this potential uh, the wave function is uh, or the lowest wave function is simply uh, the ground state basically the ground state wave function is simply a Gaussian uh, I told you that it's a Hermite polynomial multiplied by a Gaussian so that polynomial for the lowest one is equal to one or a constant and uh, it's only a Gaussian uh, which has a width which is given by this magnetic length which we have written down several times which is h cross over eb okay uh, this came in the wave function if you look at uh, the previous uh, classes uh, you'll see that uh, these lb uh, which we call it as a magnetic length and we call it a lb because it depends on b all right so uh, this uh, potential is uh, this and it is quite uh, flat uh, at all uh, places or rather in all regions between minus a and plus a and shows a discontinuity at the edges okay so what we can do is that even if there is say some disorder and impurity where the potential can actually be like this in between and we really uh, do not care about the nature of the potential which is what we'll show there now uh, this potential uh, is smoothly varying okay at all places excepting at the boundaries so we can do a taylor expansion of this potential v of x which is equal to v of x zero and a plus a del v del x 
uh, x minus x0 plus terms other terms which we neglect okay so this is the first and uh, term see v of x0 is a constant which uh, you're doing a taylor expansion about a point x0 uh, and uh, uh, assuming that this is smooth uh, even though with disorder it doesn't look smooth but then if you pick up a, a region uh, where it looks smooth this expansion can still be done and uh, once this uh, uh, you do the expansion the middle term that is uh, uh, the first term is anyway a constant so it, it doesn't bother us much uh, this looks like um, an electric field okay so it's like a potential due to an electric field okay so then uh, because of this uh, term uh, the particle actually acquires a velocity in the uh, y direction uh, so there is a drift velocity in the y direction so that drift velocity can be written as a uh, vy equal to minus uh, eb and a del v del x as it's written there so this is the drift velocity in the y direction Okay, so uh, once we get this, uh, of course, uh, uh, each momentum is actually uh, labeled by a uh, wave function rather. Each wave function is labeled by a momentum k, uh, which uh, is uh, located at different x positions, that is different values of x, uh, which is given by x equal to minus k uh, lb square and this k is the momentum and then lb is the magnetic length that we have talked about and it has a drift velocity. So now you see that in this uh, left edge uh, del v del x is negative okay and and the right edge it is positive. So del v del x is negative here and it is del v del x is positive here. And this is why we said that the modes are chiral because they have opposite velocities at the two edges. Remember we just said that at the two edges they move in uh, different directions and because their uh, sign of the uh, velocities, drift velocities in the y direction are uh, different. Of course now we are talking this as the y direction. You just change your picture. You could draw this picture like this. And if you're more comfortable in thinking uh, about y direction being this and so on. And so on. And then you have uh, all these cyclotron orbits which do not uh, take part in any kind of conductivity. Okay. So this because of this sign difference between the two uh, this del v del x at the two edges uh, the electrons move with different uh, velocities or directions uh, at the two edges of the sample. So if uh, v y at the left edge has a it has a sign uh, different sign with respect to that at the right edge and uh, because there is a drift in the y direction that is v y there will be a current that will be generated which I can find it out by taking this uh, dk over 2 pi this is like the one dimensional Brillouin zone and dk is uh, integrating over all the k modes or the momentum values and then I also divide it by 2 pi just that you know it does not blow up and I so because the uh, 1d Brillouin zone is from minus pi to plus pi so this is divided usually by uh, 2 pi. If you take a two dimensional Brillouin zone this will be like d2k divided by 2 pi whole square and so on okay. So this is uh, in one dimension we are talking about so it is a vy uh, and a dk. Okay, and then uh, we put uh, all these uh, factors there. So one gets that it's a two pi l b square. Uh, l b square is equal to h cross over e b, and this is equal to a d x one over e b, and del v del x, which I uh, basically write it as d v d x without any loss of uh, generality. So 
uh, it is uh, now a k space integral in this step is converted into a real space by using these uh, velocity expression and we have also used lb equal to or lb square equal to h cross over eb okay now let me uh, calculate this neatly so uh, we have uh, the i y the uh, this i y can be actually calculated uh, to be equal to e square over 2 pi h cross uh, into v h okay where uh, 2 pi h cross is of course nothing but h uh, and v h is the hall voltage okay then what happens is that uh, if you get this then a sigma x y which is the hall conductivity or you can talk about the hall resistivity which is inverse of that uh, this is equal to i y by v h uh, or in other words rho x y which is equal to v h by i y which gives you uh, h over e square okay so this is uh, the a conductivity or uh, the resistivity let's let's talk about resistivity uh, you can call talked about conductivity for the so let's say uh, conductivity of a single landau level and this resistivity Even though we have derived it for just one Landau level, it does not matter uh, if you have a number of Landau levels, um, uh, many of them, uh, because um, you know, as long as your Fermi energy uh, lies uh, completely covering one Landau level or the other, this argument still holds good. The other good part of this is that we have not talked about uh, the explicit form of V of X. We simply have taken that they have uh, discontinuity or there, there's a sharp rise only at the edges and uh, you have uh, no problem in assuming that even if that red curve that we had shown it with, uh, it is also equally applicable. So the details of VX is missing and that's why this uh, argument is elegant uh, because there's no um, sort of specifics of the potential that's um, included it also you know saves us from this uh, ambiguity that we have been facing that uh, how a landau level uh, can conduct because the landau levels were found to be extremely flat and extremely flat uh, uh, implies that there is uh, uh, there's no velocity the kinetic energy is zero so if the kinetic energy is zero, how does it uh, conduct? And the conduction is really happening at the edges. If you, uh, you know, go here and if you try to, uh, let's, let me use a color. So this is where the Fermi level is, and then you have a conduction because that is where here at this point, let me uh, circle it out here and here, the levels, the Landau levels actually uh, meet the Fermi level. So if there is a, a crossing of any of the levels across the Fermi level, then there has to be uh, metallic uh, conductivity, metallic like conductivity. Okay. So um, as I said that we have discussed it for a single Landau level, but it uh, holds for uh, a large number of Landau levels as well. Uh, as long as uh, the Fermi energy uh, lies between the filled and the unfilled Landau levels, okay? And uh, let me ask another question. Why uh, are the uh, plateaus robust, but also why are the edge modes robust? And when I say robust, I mean that because there are a lot of impurities and so on, so induced by the impurities or induced by the scattering of the impurities uh, don't the edge modes also go away uh, don't they melt away in a heavily disordered sample and the answer is no the edge modes are robust because of the reason that if you think uh, of this picture again you can uh, decide on your x and y axis uh, the edge modes are here and they are here 
So there are no states for these edge modes to scatter because all of them are insulating modes. All these modes here, they do not allow the electrons to occupy because they are all insulating ones. Their character is completely different from the character that you have for the edge modes. Okay, So if this thing has to scatter, it has to scatter from here to here or here to here because that is where only you have metallic edges or the nature of the states are conducting. Okay, I mean the nature is conducting for only the edges and they cannot scatter and because you are talking about a macroscopic sample, uh, this is too far off and the probability of scattering would be uh, extremely small. Okay, So this is the uh, reason that can be assigned to the robustness of the edge modes and they do not go away. In fact, what happens is that uh, there are uh, experiments. So if you actually put a single impurity like this, so this is the impurity that you have put and uh, try to you know uh, find out the edge modes. So the edge modes will do like this. So they will you know. So this is in this direction say in this direction. So they will simply uh, you maneuver around the impurity and will not get scattered by it because if it gets scattered then it has to scatter to some state available state. There is no phase space for scattering and that is why they cannot uh, scatter to anything and they will remain robust um, and will give rise to the conductivity. Let us ask another question or rather rephrase this how the plateaus are robust. plateaus in the Hall resistivity or conductivity. So this uh, I mean how do they exist and they are so much of impurity and disorder why they do not just again just melt away just as we said. So suppose we have only filled Landau levels okay, and uh, such that the magnetic field is like this it is n0 by nu and a phi 0, we have defined everything your phi 0 equal to h over e, n0 is the electron density and nu is an integer. Okay? So this is the condition that has to be satisfied uh, for uh, the plateau to occur because we have said that uh, b over phi 0 equal to some n0 by nu and this just that equality condition would give rise to a plateau. So the moment you are tuning b, you go out of this condition and your b becomes not equal to n0 by nu and a phi 0. Okay? So for a point that is for a given point, this condition is satisfied and at the next point that is at the next available value of the magnetic field and how do you change the magnetic field? You change the current in the electromagnet which is producing the magnetic field. So the magnetic field changes its value and this condition uh, goes out of balance and the equality becomes a non-equality. If that happens then how are plateaus formed in the first place? Because then you will have a small, you know, infinitesimally small region where this condition is satisfied and after that this condition is not satisfied. Now here is where the disorder comes into the picture and which is what has been told earlier that consider a single Landau level. This Landau level looks very sharp when we have calculated it from considering uh, an electron in a magnetic field, but however, when there is disorder in the system, this really looks like a, a band of certain width. Okay? Then uh, it gives a finite width to the Landau levels. Uh, I will be writing Landau levels as LL in a lot of places. Uh, so please get used to it. So even if this condition, uh, it goes out of, this equation goes out of balance, that is the equality breaks down, even then the plateaus continue to exist because of this certain, uh, you know, width of the Landau levels now uh, owing to disorder. Okay? Disorder 
does not mix two Landau levels. The other Landau level is here, which is also slightly broadened. Okay, and this broadening is due to disorder. Okay, so uh, it the sigma x y remains constant, or the rho x y remains constant as you know the chemical potential sweeps through this or the magnetic field is increased uh, the there is for a region that is uh, you know this inequality conditions remains as equality uh, because there are a lot of uh, conducting levels that are available and um, that's why uh, this rho xy it's a uh, freezes at a given value and then when you increase magnetic field enough uh, then these uh, physically the chemical potential goes out of this band and uh, there has to be a jump in the rho x y and so on which is what we have said okay so this is the reason that this plateaus are robust and they don't go away and uh, if you make the uh, sample more and more disordered uh, there is nothing happens to these plateaus because these plateaus actually they arise because of the presence of disorder and of course uh, the magnetic field has to be large if the magnetic field is very small and still you have uh, disorder present in the system then these two Landau levels are too close to each other and this is exactly what happens in classical uh, Hall effect which uh, Edwin Hall had discovered in 1879 uh, where he had shown that uh, the the Hall resistivity actually linearly increases uh, with um, with uh, so b and such that the Hall coefficient is actually a constant <coughs> which gives you the uh, 1 over n e where n becomes uh, electronic density. So uh, in that case uh, the Landau levels are close to each other the two conditions that are responsible for this uh, one is that the magnetic field was very small there I told you it's around uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 Tesla which is very small here the magnetic field is uh, of the order of a few Tesla even you know uh, some uh, close to uh, 10 to 15 Tesla and the temperature is low so uh, there is nothing it it sort of uh, makes the Landau levels come any close uh, to each other there's just a broadening induced by disorder okay so let me uh, go to another related topic uh, the nature of the Landau levels uh, I am particularly talking about incompressibility. Okay. Now, you have to understand what is incompressible. In uh, an electronic system, how is incompressibility defined? You can understand that maybe a steel, uh, a piece of steel or a piece of brick or a piece of concrete is in incompressible because you're trying to compress it and it doesn't respond, okay. A sponge may be uh, compressible, a piece of clay is compressible. Uh, but in uh, electronic systems, incompressibility is defined slightly uh, differently. What it means is that um, you are putting in more and more electrons into the system but the chemical potential does not increase. Let me spend a few minutes talking about the chemical potential, what it is. And if you read any book on statistical mechanics, it will tell you that it is the energy required to add one particle in the system, may it be fermions or bosons or anything, okay, or classical particles. So, uh, why uh, do we need energy to add one particle in the system? Can't we simply add that? Is there a energy cost associated with this? Yes, there is an energy cost associated with this. Uh, you can understand this in this particular fashion in which uh, this is the distribution uh, or this is called as a Fermi Dirac distribution and this is called as a Fermi energy. Uh, now the Fermi energy and chemical potential are related. Fermi energy uh, is the chemical potential at t equal to 0. At t not equal to 0, 
the definition of Fermi energy becomes fuzzy. It no longer exists. So, it is uh, chemical potential can be talked about at any temperature. Okay? Uh, the Fermi surface itself is not a well defined quantity at finite temperature. So, what I mean to say is epsilon f is mu at t equal to 0. Okay, so we are talking about t equal to 0, so we can talk about uh, mu or epsilon f, it does not matter. If you now want to add one particle to the system, all these states are filled. Okay, so you have to add it right here, just after this. If you see this black spot that I have drawn, you have to add it there. So you have to spend that much of energy. Okay. Now, if you physically want to understand that in any given system, it is not fermions, but in any given system, how that energy cost comes about if you try to add one particle. So, what will happen is that if you try to add one particle, suppose one uh, student enters a class okay, and you can, uh, you can always claim that uh, he goes and sits uh, in the, the seat that is vacant or the bench that is uh, vacant for him to occupy. But uh, for the electrons, all of these uh, other electrons will have to come to equilibrium along with this particle being added or this electron being added to the system, they all have to come to equilibrium again and that costs energy and this is the energy cost uh, that we talk about or in uh, sort of defining a chemical potential, it is uh, defined by mu. Okay. So, the incompressibility of a system is you know discussed or rather it is detailed whether a mu is uh, a function of n. So, it is by this del mu del n and so on and so forth. Okay. We will uh, see this uh, in just a while, uh, but um, let me talk about the compressibility, the definition of compressibility. Uh, or even uh, equivalently one can talk about bulk modulus, but let us talk about compressibility here. You have to remember that we are talking about a two dimensional system. So, we instead of volume, we will have to talk about the area. So, this is 1 by area and a del A del P at a given n, where A is uh, area, P is pressure. So, if we are converging on the definition that a sponge uh, actually if you put pressure it crumbles, if you put more pressure it crumbles even more um, and of course, it will go to a situation where you cannot compress a sponge also even farther. What we want to say is that uh, these uh, plateaus, uh, in fact, I should say that instead of the Landau levels, um, uh, we can say the quantum Hall states, in fact, those are better description of this. So. So, nature of the quantum Hall states. Okay. So, P is pressure and A is area and N is the total number of particles. All right. So, uh, this is the definition and um, so, uh, how is pressure, thermodynamic uh, pressure defined? The pressure is defined as minus del E del A, where a E denotes the internal energy of the system or del U del A if you, whichever symbol you want to use. So, this is the definition of uh, in a 2D, of course, this is a del E del V in uh, 3D. So, this is the a definition of uh, the pressure. So, if you put that then uh, the 1 by kappa, uh, the kappa inverse uh, that is how it is usually written uh, which is equal to uh, this also called as a bulk modulus. So, this is del P del A uh, n uh, at a given n. So, this is equal to A the minus signs cancel and it is a double derivative of the energy with respect to the change in area at a given n. So, this is the definition of compressibility for us for this 2D uh, electron gas. Again, we will use this uh, nomenclature or this abbreviation several times. Uh, 2D eg means two dimensional electron gas. Let me write it once and for all. Okay. 
Okay, so we'll use this definition. Now, sort of show that or rather state that energy is an extensive quantity. You all know that. That is, it depends on the number of particles. Okay, uh, which means E is equal to N uh, epsilon N where epsilon is the energy per particle uh, per, per particle and uh, n small n is the density that is it's the particle density or electron density whatever you want to call it okay so uh, what it means is that uh, so this uh, density actually is so your n the total n is equal to uh, a times n Okay, so this is the aerial density, it's also called as the aerial density. So the total number of particles is the total area multiplied by this density and uh, this uh, 1 over kappa including this is written as this uh, a few steps that you have to you know uh, do telling you the essential steps it's d d of 1 over n slightly complicated uh, derivative that I am talking about I am not talking about d d n but d d of 1 by n it is equal to d epsilon n and then uh, d of 1 over n. So it is uh, you know a double derivative but the variable here inside is not n that is the density but it is 1 over n and if you do this carefully you get this as 2 d epsilon n d n plus n d 2 epsilon n d n 2 ok. So, this is the expression for the compressibility or the inverse of the compressibility. If you further simplify it, it becomes d n square into d2 n epsilon and uh, d n2. Now uh, going back to the chemical potential, so mu which is the chemical potential this has a definition of uh, mu equal to del E del n that is how uh, if you change uh, the number of particle, how does the energy uh, responds to it? It responds to it. That is uh, how the energy uh, responds to change in the number of particles and uh, at a constant volume. And this is equal to d of n epsilon divided by d n and of course at a constant volume which is. Uh, so, this 1 over k really looks like n square uh, d mu d n. Probably this is a result which uh, um, is known, but I still derived it because uh, this result is not known in the context of 2D. Because we are talking about a two dimensional electron gas, maybe this result is important. And uh, so, what it tells you is that uh, the inverse of the compressibility is related to. Uh, the del mu del n that is how uh, the chemical potential responds to the change in the number of particles ok. For the quantum Hall states mu increases discontinuously. Okay. Now, this is important to understand because I told you that as you change the magnetic field uh, mu does not increase it sort of uh, freezes and then it shows an increase with further increase in the value of the magnetic field. So, this del mu del n is actually um, you know uh, or del n del mu uh, is actually equal to uh, 0 for the plateaus 
and if this is equal to 0, your uh, kappa will become equal to 0. I, so, I inverted it so that uh, you can talk about kappa to be equal to 0. So, this tells you that the quantum Hall states, so QH, let us QH states are incompressible. Okay. This is an important idea or uh, this is an important input to the problem that these plateaus uh, that arise in the Hall conductivity or the resistivity are incompressible in nature. That is even if you try to pack more particles, it does not accept the chemical potential does not go up. Okay. So, it becomes um, you know a sort of uh, the, the del n del mu or the del mu del n uh, they are discontinuous function and so on. So, uh, now uh, let me uh, show you a derivation of the Hall resistance, a very simplified derivation uh, before we embark on a more thorough derivation for uh, the Hall resistance using Kubo formula. Okay. All right. So, um, let us uh, talk about a, a sample length L. Okay, just arbitrary length L. So, uh, the electric current carried by each charge each electron that is each charge or electrons in this length in this L is uh, equal to minus E V over L where V denotes the group velocity. Okay. And of course, E is the electronic charge. So, the total number of the total number of electrons uh, between momentum range, I am writing it in short, momentum range P and P plus dP not writing it as a vector because uh, it uh, here it does not matter. I, it can be found by multiplying the two things which uh, one of them is uh, the current carrying per unit charge which is minus E V over L and then you multiply it by uh, the L by H uh, into D P. Okay? So, uh, you multiply it by the current carrying per unit charge by this quantity H being the Planck's constant. Okay. So, it is uh, in this uh, range and so the current that comes is equal to minus E V over L into L by H and a dP. So, that is the current the elemental current that uh, is there uh, in this small length L in the momentum range P and P plus dP that is the, the current that is generated. So, this current now this is a, an elemental current uh, the full current or the complete expression for current can be found out by integrating this between uh, some P 1 to P 2 which corresponds to the momentum values at uh, the say the bottom edge and the top edge uh, uh, depending upon you know which direction uh, the current is flowing. Uh, so, uh, th they are the top and the bottom edges are assumed to be perpendicular to the flow of the current. Okay? So, then uh, the current total current is equal to some P 1 to P 2 which corresponds to the two edges as I said is minus E over H and uh, there is a D E D P uh, and this D P and this is nothing but equal to minus E by H and the 
potential energy at the uh, let us write it as BE that is the bottom edge minus VTE that is the top edge. Okay? So, this is the uh, reason that this uh, the current flows where BE that it, it denotes the bottom edge and the TE denotes the top edge. Okay. So, this is the potential energy and uh, I can write down the potential energy as you know minus E by H and this is like a minus E V2 say the, uh, the voltage at the bottom edge is V2 and uh, it is uh, V1 at the top edge. So, this is equal to minus E V1. So, this is equal to uh, it gives you E square over H the E will come out and this is equal to V2 minus V1. Okay. So, this is the this is the conductivity uh, or rather this is the total current which is uh, V 2 minus V 1. So, if I want to calculate the Hall uh, resistivity which I write it as V 2 minus V uh, 1 by I this is of course, H over E square. Now, you see that. So, this is the Hall conductivity the unit of the Hall conductivity. We have not done a very sophisticated analysis we just simply you know uh, sort of uh, wrote down the elemental current due to um, a certain number of charges in a length element DL uh, and whose uh, momenta uh, lie between P and P plus dP and from there we have calculated the total current and have calculated the the Hall resistivity. Uh, so, this is uh, you know for an arbitrary filling fraction this for just for one electron. Uh, so, this is the Hall resistivity for nu equal to 1. Okay? Uh, so, for an arbitrary filling So, your R h becomes exactly of the form that you are familiar with it is nu e square where nu uh, is an integer for the plateaus to take place. Okay? And um, this you know in a way most of the things that are relevant to the story of the Hall effect uh, or to understand the phenomena of Hall effect uh, has been uh, explained. Okay. It is as I told that it is the first known topological insulator because the bulk and the edge they behave differently with regard to their electronic conductivities or electric conductivities or resistivities. And such a thing has never been seen and not only that the metrology part that I have been talking about right from the beginning that uh, it has been able to find out this quantity to be giving you the you know unit of resistance which is 25.813 kilo ohm. So, resistance is what you measure in the lab you can buy a multimeter in the market and that will measure resistivity. The scale is set by uh, purely quantum mechanical quantities such as H and E uh, and such coarse grain experiment that two dimensional electron gas. Uh, placed in a magnetic field transverse magnetic field is able to give you the scale of the uh, resistivity and uh, that is a big achievement. So, uh, these uh, the people who do metrology who uh, sort of fix the standards uh, or work in this bureau of standards uh, they uh, say it uh, and this uh, name of uh, Professor Klitz Singh is taken with uh, great respect because of this uh, experiment being done and uh, the plateaus were seen and uh, as I said that uh, Edwin Hall probably would have seen this if he had access to uh, large electromagnets that could have given rise to very large magnetic fields which was not available in 1879. Okay? And so, he could not see he saw uh, the Hall resistivity to be a linear function of, uh, uh, of the magnetic field 
and uh, which is not the case here. Uh, one actually sees that the series of plateaus in the Hall resistivity, it is only uh, the resistivity uh, shifts from one plateau to another and when it shifts, it jumps uh, discontinuously. So, there is almost a discontinuous jump there, um, which means a sharp jump and um, not only that, uh, the uh, the magneto resistivity or uh, the resistivity that is there in the direction of the flow of current uh, is 0 most of the time, excepting when the Hall resistivity shows a jump, it shows a peak in the uh, resistivity in the magneto resistivity. And this phenomena, uh, this behavior of the magneto resistivity is uh, also reveals something very important uh, because if it is 0, the magneto resistivity is 0 which means uh, the current uh, is uh, completely you know blocked. Uh, so, as if there is an insulating uh, behavior which uh, uh, or rather there is a conducting behavior because the rho is 0. So, the resistivity is 0. So, there is a conducting behavior and suddenly there is a peak in the resistivity sh which shows that it is an insulating behavior and then again a conducting behavior when uh, sigma xx or rho xx falls to 0 and so on. And I have also shown that uh, it can happen only in systems uh, with uh, you know in presence of magnetic field that uh, the rho xx and the sigma xx can simultaneously become equal to 0 because one of them the ambiguity is that the one of them talks about a perfect insulator then the other talks about a perfect conductor. So, when rho xx equal to 0, you know that it is a perfect conductor because there is no resistivity and when sigma xx is also equal to 0, it means that there is a perfect insulator which. So, both of them cannot be there together otherwise not in presence of magnetic field. So, the magnetic field, the role of the magnetic field is supreme and the two dimensionality is supreme. I will talk about this, uh, uh, this variation of the uh, this uh, magneto resistance that is sigma xx or rho xx. However, a full treatment of that would be uh, difficult in this course because it is a, a non-equilibrium phenomenon and one actually would uh, do it via uh, this Boltzmann transport equation uh, where uh, the relaxation time needed to be uh, or it needs to be calculated. Uh, I will not go into the details of those calculations of sigma xx, however, would uh, uh, qualitatively explain uh, what uh, are these uh, or how these uh, sigma xx or rho xx have uh, oscillations. So, this along with we will talk about the experimental situations or experimental systems and so on, uh, which uh, should give you a, a more or less a complete description about the phenomenon or Hall effect in a 2D electron gas. Mm -hmm.